Welcome, Lisa, to Fast to Heal Stories. I'm so happy to have you here. We are going to talk about your success story with intermittent fasting today, and you have your own lovely podcast as well. Um, and we'll talk about to talk more about that as well as we go. But um, yeah, you have a fascinating story and love having you on today. Thank so, you. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just jump right in and talk about what turned you on to intermittent fasting because you've been a radio host and <laughs> in the media for years and years and years. And yeah. more recently, been turned on to intermittent fasting, become a health coach. So tell us how you got there and why you love, you know, why you even began the intermittent fasting lifestyle. Well, I've always been in, I mean, as my adult career, even in college and before I was always in front of a camera, I was all, I'm a journalist. So, um, TV personality, TV reporter, radio editor of a magazine. If there are words, I like communicating them any way I can. I love the text, you know, <laughs> I love an email, anything where words are involved. So I say all that just to preface that um, there's a different audience for uh, if you're on the radio, if you're on TV, if you're on radio, you can be five or 10 pounds overweight and nobody's nobody upstairs is talking to you about your weight. But when I was on TV, um, if if I'd gained five or 10 pounds that the brass would notice. Now, I know things have changed, but that's how it was. I mean, we were just discussed asking, you know, what, what's going on? Um, and so when you first have those early, when, when your st weight starts shifting in your twenties and thirties, you really don't know why now I do. Now I understand the role of insulin and that we're hormonally wired as Jason Fung famously says, we're hormonally, hormonally wired to eat and to stop eating. And so of course we blamed it on calories in the eighties and nineties. So, um, I I just had probably, you know, five pound weight gain after I got married, not a big deal. And then by the time I was 30, I'd had my first child and I, I would lose the weight, but it was a struggle. It was, you know, a lot of walking and exercising and nursing the baby and staying active. And still any day, I think I always felt like I was on this tightrope that I could fall off any time, Shanna, that any time I would be a size 12 again and not a six or eight. I'm five foot eight. So, and I, I didn't know what it was, but we were all hanging on to Diet Coke and Weight Watchers meetings and Diet Center and supplements and whatever we could find. So then um, I'd, I'd taken some time off on television radio because I was raising my children. I homeschooled and I, I got back on, and this is right in probably in 2000 or so when kind of message boards were a thing and and that's how you can, you know, if you, if you want to talk about something, you had a message board and I was back on radio and doing some TV and someone told me and said, Hey, I saw that you're, you're back. And they said, I saw you on, I saw on the message board and they're wondering, you know, what had happened to you that you'd gained all this weight. And it was really 15 pounds, but to on camera at uh, Kirstie Alley made that very famous and look who's talking that um, about the weight gain of what we look like, you know, we do uh, weight gain does translate more on camera than it does in person. So I was really frustrated. So uh, about 20 years ago, I, I was almost 40 years old. And now I understand I was going through something called thyropause. You know, that's a term that's kind of used. My, my thyroid was starting to peter out um, years of stress, years, you know, of just life, right? I was starting to mm, develop some autoimmune conditions. At the same time, I was perimenopause, but nobody knew that. Nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about my hormones. I had to fight my way to get a diagnosis for my Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And it was one of the worst cases they had seen once they looked at the antibodies. So people, if you're listening and you're getting the conversation, they pat you on the knee and tell you to go take a B vitamin and that um, you need to lose five or 10 pounds, ask them to look at your antibody panel. And so my antibody panel was off the page. And that was the same time I was developing this vitiligo. That's the disease Michael Jackson said he had. And whether he had it or not, you, you don't, you're, you don't lose all the pigment in your face. He chose 
to bleach or do some type of procedure to get rid of the pigment, which I don't care, but it's not a representation of what vitiligo looks like. Vitiligo is uh, patches of melanin where your body is not producing melanin anymore. There's a famous African-American model who is on America's Top Model, Winnie Harlow. She is absolutely gorgeous. So her cafe au lait skin with the white patches is a work of art. Well, for me, it's not, you know, it's splotchy. I hate it, but it was, I say all this because it's also a piece of the puzzle for me when somebody is presenting. So anyone listening, if you're looking and thinking, yeah, I've got some of those white patches and I've gained some weight and I'm tired. Oh, don't, don't go to an endocrinologist, find a functional medicine provider who can look at the why of what's going on. So my journey with really health began then. I started realizing, Shanna, that women were underrepresented in somehow being heard by a provider when she's about 40. She's gained about five or 10 pounds. Her periods start getting a little wonky. She starts getting a little moody, might have some heart palpitations. It all coincided with the fact that I, I was going through these hormonal changes. Nobody was really paying attention or addressing them. I was trying to, and I wasn't losing weight and I couldn't imagine why, like nothing had changed. I still, now I feel like I was working out too much mm -hmm. because you and I know what cortisol does. So after 40, we know that the ovaries start to peter out. The adrenals have to get involved and you really don't want to call your adrenals up people. You don't want them to come out for the battle because they send sometimes the wrong soldiers. They send the fat storing soldiers, which cortisol then makes us insulin resistant. And the minute you're insulin resistant, guess what? You've gained weight. You're storing fat. So nobody really listens to that. But so um, fast forward to 2017. Um, I can't do math, but I was, uh, I'm 60 now. So I was about 54 or something like that. Again, I can't do math. Um, and my son who had was coming home from college and he would have these seven hour road trips. We're in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he was a school at Baton Rouge at LSU. And um, he's an engineer and those people love to study. Like they love learning. And I do too, but I don't have the math acumen, but I, I'm all, and, and I'm a journalist and a good journalist is a good student. We don't really show our opinion. That has changed. Okay, <laughs> sidebar. But back in the day, we went and got the information, we assimilated it, and we gave it to you. You made your decision, right? So he kind of did that. He came back from uh, Baton Rouge for Thanksgiving weekend, and he was an early adopter of podcasting. Like in 2017, before that, I wasn't listening to podcasting until he told me about this podcast with Jen Stevens and Melanie Avalon called the Intermittent Fasting Podcast. And he came home and it was the day after Thanksgiving that we were having a conversation. He said, hey, mom, have you heard about intermittent fasting? Oh, girl, I got so defensive. I said, I am hypoglycemic and I have to eat 19 times a day and I have thyroid disease and I have to have a caloric intake of this and I eat low fat and I eat blah, 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 you know, or whatever my righteous diet was at the time. And he was like, mom, you're, I mean, he even said, you're kind of being a little defensive. And I go, well, if I said, this is what I said to him. If you think your mother needs to lose weight, you won't see your 20th birthday, but go <laughs> ahead and sit down and tell me what you want to tell me. And he goes, no, mom, I'm telling, I said, is that why you're telling me this? He goes, no, I'm telling you this because you love all things health. And I go, my words were, what does starving yourself have to do with health? And he said, well, let me sit down and talk to you about it. So he sat, uh, we had just finished dinner. It was 6.30 on a Friday night, November 24th, 2017. And he said, no, mom. Uh, he played intramural football at LSU and all the athletes were doing intermittent fasting to get cut. And uh, the U.S. was about, or all countries were about to go to the Olympics in 2018 to Rio. And all the athletes were doing this intermittent fasting and Broadway stars were doing intermittent fasting. And I was like, I don't understand. You're starving yourself. He goes, no, you're reducing the amount of hours in the day that you eat. Now he didn't tell me the insulin component at the time, but I said, 
So how does it benefit you? He said, well, you produce these ketone bodies, you burn fat for fuel. He goes, you need to listen to this podcast with these two women. They're from the South. They giggle a lot. It's a little too, isn't that funny? He said, it's a little too girly for me, but he said, I really learned a lot. And he goes, I learned this new term called autophagy. And now we know autophagy. (laughs) And so again, the journalist in me said, well, I'm going to look into this. I like, I like the idea. And so I just started listening to those podcasts with Jen, which I love seeing your quote. I have Jen's new book and her new book, her 28 day fast feast, repeat 28 day guide. Um, you're one of the first quotes that I noticed. I went, Oh, I know her. Um, (laughs) and, and so at that point, that was a Friday night. I said, so what do I, I'm an easy sell at this point. What do I do? And he said, well, don't eat again until tomorrow at 1230. We'd put the fork down at 630 that night. I go, okay. Well, now we call that an 18 and six eating window, right? Now, I don't recommend that for people in the beginning because they think you're you're being abusive if you don't let them eat at least for, you know, more hours in the day than just six. But I did it because, again, I was like, I, I just knew he was a smart kid. He, he He's done the, the homework. So that next morning, you know, I got up. So I was on the radio then. I was getting up at 345 during the week to be on a morning show. But on weekends, I live it up. I sleep in till 7 a.m. So <laughs> Sounds like me. part of that, yeah, part of that time you're sleeping till seven, you're fasting, right? So then I just knew I didn't, I wasn't going to eat till about 1230. I was like, I can do that. And so I did that on Sunday. Well, then he drove back to Baton Rouge and I called him. I mean, I was hanging on to his coattail before he left. I went, how am I going to get up at 345 tomorrow and not eat till 1230? And he was like, you're going to make it. I said, if I die, it's on you. <laughs> he was like, mom, you're not going to die, you know? And so that first morning I went back, I got on the radio. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I didn't have to make, that is a, I know that that is a death grip for people who have to have their creamer and their ice cream coffee or the candy coffee in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I know that that's a shock. Well, I'm drinking, I have, it's 847 here in the morning. So I'm just drinking water. But what I did do for years, I self-righteously sipped on stevia water when I was in the control room because it had zero calories Mm -hmm. it was cherry flavored so girl i was pumping out that insulin all morning Mm -hmm. typically but now that day i didn't he said no drink green tea black tea unsweetened tea he knew i didn't drink coffee or he said drink water flat or still or flat or sparkling so okay so those first few days you know i was like all right. I, I wanted to eat the countertops at 1230. Right. And I did it. Yeah. The first two weeks, once the first two weeks are in the rear view mirror, it's paradise ahead of you. I mean, it is totally paradise because you're over, or, or was for me, I was over the hurdle. I wasn't fat adapted yet, which we know is a, a physiological reaction that your body has when you're no longer burning glucose for energy and you're burning ketones and you've burned out the glycogen stores in your liver. So those, but the first two weeks are the hunger satiety and the I'm used to eating all day. And one thing he didn't tell me too was, and what I tell everybody, I'm sure you do too, is eat salt. Like this morning I got up, I already had probably an eighth of a teaspoon of Redmond sea salt had it just for my electrolytes, just to get my brain going, just to get things going. So that was 2017. And since I was on the radio and, you know, in between playing Taylor Swift or, you know, Cindy Lauper, I would get on the radio and say, Hey, well, my co-host wanted to know about it. He said, let's talk about it on the radio. And at first, because like so many of you, I was afraid of failure. I didn't want anyone to know because Remember I had those 15 pounds that were hanging on me that people noticed when I was still, I was doing TV commercials and my pants were tight. You know, I was thicker or thicker. Am I overweight? No, I'm five, eight and about 150, and I'm six years old. I'm, I'm a fine weight, but weight's not my barometer, right? It's, it's my health. So it, after about a month or so, I finally talked about it on the radio and then I still have radio listeners who have joined, you know, 
the cult that we're in of fasting or the religion. And they say, I heard about it first when you started talking about it on the radio. So then um, I just incorporated in my lifestyle. I never looked back. I left the radio in 2018. I'm glad because things started changing there um, with health requirements that I would have never, never uh, abided by. I mean, of course I wouldn't, I just wouldn't have. Um, and I did get my health coaching certification from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, New York. And I still do TV and radio. Anyone wants to hire me, you can contact me, but <laughs> I really focus my day on helping women, especially like you do grab this bull by the horns and realize that it is, it, it's, it's a mountain that is about this big. It's not Mount Everest, but it seems big because it seems like a huge thing to say. You can have candy coffee in the morning and you uh, can't sip on stevia. Oh, the other thing I had to give up was gum. Oh. <clears throat> that was a big give up for me. Be and now I, what I think I understand is I don't have bad breath now because I'm not churning acids from my abdomen all day. I'm eating just in a few hours. I brush my teeth in the morning. I brush after, you know, usually in the middle of the day and evening. So I don't need the gum because I ain't got no bad breath. I say that pridefully. <laughs> um, but it's just one of the little, what we call the non-scale victories, the things we enjoy about with intermittent fasting, as Jen Stevens calls it, the health plan with the side effect of weight loss. And that's that's where I stand to you right now. It took me 30 minutes to tell you that, but it's just my story just to say that I've always had an interest in health because of my own health 20 years ago, but I didn't really, rubber didn't meet the road until I left radio, got my certification, and now I want to, I want to help people because you're being lied to. <laughs> That's all I want to tell you. You're being lied to. Big food and big pharma have a big financial interest in what you do in your life and you and I can help them. Absolutely. I love that story. And it's so funny when you say about the gum, because I chew gum for like one or two minutes after my meal, just as you Are know, you minty, freshy thing. I okay. never, like I, my jaw gets tired. I just like uh -huh. to chew it right after my meal, kind of just like close, you know, in my head, it's yeah. like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm done eating. Yeah. That's but good. It is, it's funny. Like I, I hardly eat any sugar anymore. And every once in a while I have like, you know, you have your gluten-free dessert or for a birthday or whatever that has regular sugar in it. And I can feel my teeth getting like furry within the hour. And I'm like, it oh is fur. Goodness. Like my, like they just feel clean all day with how I eat now. And like you said, it's not, it's like the acids, but I think a lot of it is sugar too. And just food yeah, you know, and sure. like all of the, the microbes that are in there, eating, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is, but I'm sure so many women are sitting here like, Oh, that's me. Like Lisa is me. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, that's, I, I tried so hard and we talk about this all the time. Like women's like, we tried so hard. We, we follow the guidelines. We're doing I what did. we're supposed to do. We're calorically restricted. I did. Our thyroid goes to, you know, pot. And, yeah. you know, if you've had children, then you're, you know, you're even more yes. likely to have thyroid issues because yes. really exacerbate after pregnancy and after nursing and just those fluctuations. So I love that you're, that you're sharing your story. And it's so interesting. You had such a captive audience I with, did. You know, being on the radio, but you're like, Oh no, I don't want to share this because I said like, there's so many women sitting here and maybe a first time listener and thinking, oh, I don't want to tell my family about this. I don't want to tell my friends right. about this. This is weird. They're going to think I'm starving. They're going mm -hmm. to malnourish, you know, they're just think I'm going to, you know, I'll do this for a month or two and fail. So give us a little bit about the timeline of your, like your fasting routine, because we know that not everybody's fasting routine should be the same. It's not going to work the same, but people are always curious, like, okay, what did you do? What did you have to change up? Like, what does your typical day look like? And for you, like you're still working on heal healing your thyroid and your vitiligo uh -huh. and you have some autoimmune issues. So your protocol is going to look different than somebody else who maybe, yeah, like maybe has five to 10 pounds to lose, but they're not dealing with an autoimmune issue or 
they're 30 versus 60. Like there's just such a spectrum here, but people are always interested in, <laughs> you know, how you got to where, where you are and what's your, you know, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Well, 2017 is a different picture. And I, I explain this because it is a metamorphosis. I mean, it and it's a constant tweaking because metabolically we change, hormonally we change as we age, but we can fight some of the things if we understand who, what the enemy is. And not that insulin's an enemy, you have to have it to live, but it, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? So I say all that. So in the beginning, my son sat down and said, remember, he said, don't eat again till tomorrow at 1230, starting with an 18 and six window. That is ambitious for some people. It's really not that hard, y'all. I mean, I know it sounds huge, but it's really not that hard. So I did that. And really, it was about week six that I had the magic of appetite correction. Dr. Bert Herring talks about it in his book, Appetite Correction of the Fast and some other research he has done. And Jen talks about it. So when appetite correction kicks in, you can probably agree with this. Your eating window actually might change because you realize you don't need as much food. And Dr. Fung uses the freezer analogy and refrigerator analogy and what you're getting out and all that. And someone needs to Google that because it's it, it, it's a very visual way to explain it. So I was 18 and six for a long time. Then when appetite correction kicked in, it meant my, because if you're hormonally wired to eat and to stop eating, that meant my satiety hormones were on full blast. That That's um, leptin, cholecystokinin, YY, peptide YY, or YY peptide, peptide YY, one of them. They're, they're telling you no more food. So then my window started shortening. And when we say window, we typically mean our eating window. So then I probably got just out of attrition. I didn't need as much, 19 and five, then 20 and four. Then um, after about a year or so in, I would see that I would go all day some days because I got up so early, my window was like 1230 to 630. I think if, you know, if I had a normal eight to five job, I could have gone later in the day to open that window. And so when I left radio and I had more of a normal, uh, traditional schedule, then there were days, especially if I was busy. So if you stay busy, it's amazing how the body forgets to tell you you're hungry because you're not looking at the pantry. In those days, sometimes... Um, if I was doing TV commercials or something, I really had to focus. I never eat before TV commercials because I have to read a teleprompter, which I don't love. Um, but I have to super, super, super focus, right? Well, food digestion is, a, you know, a, an amazing act that your body does every day, but it takes a lot of work. It takes brain power, it takes all these things. So if you want to do something and you really need to focus, do it in the facet state. And my son told me that as an engineering student, he did his best testing in the fasting state, which we all told our kids we had to, that we right. fed them breakfast. Oh. And all the teachers, make sure you eat a healthy breakfast before we have our state test coming up. I know, <laughs> I know. And I was, I was a part of that. Mantra and cereal too. and sugar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cereal and sugar and whatever. Right. Just, I'm so sorry. I know. We so didn't. yeah, with me, then I started realizing there were a few days it was one time I was talking to my son, he, he's an engineer in Dallas now, and I was talking to him on the way back from a TV shoot. And he goes, mom, where have you been? I said, I'm finishing up my TV shoot at six o'clock. And I told him on the phone, I'm not even hungry. And he goes, well, don't eat. And that was my first time to go, like, really do a 24 hour fast? He goes, we'll do 36 or 42. And I went, he said, just go home and drink some more liquids and have some salt. And so I did that. I've done that a few times. You have to decide what your why is at that point. Now, if I do a longer fast, it's to get into deep autophagy. I don't, I'm not chasing, like I said, a number on a scale. If I lost a pound or two, fine, but I, I don't even check. I just know, by the way, my clothes feel. And so I started doing then longer fast of 36, about 42 hours. So that means you eat on Sunday night and I didn't eat until Tuesday at lunch. And my husband had his first 42-hour um, fast this week. He's very, very fit, low body fat. And, and he was like, 
I'm not even hungry because he's so metabolically flexible and he's been intermittent fasting for so long, but he'd never had a longer fast, but he did it again just to get that deep autophagy. So now I say all this to answer the question of, I would like my goals to get a 24 hour fast in once a week for the autophagy because autophagy um, eliminates cancer cells, um, reduces your risk of diabetes and dementia. I think we're all in the same political party that we want to avoid all those things, right? So once a week, I'd like to do that. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, not that I keep to a schedule. It's just the way life is. Um, I might have an 18 and six window. And then on Friday, like today, I don't know when I'll eat. I hadn't thought about it. That's the great thing about this. I don't think about it. I don't, it's not time to eat until it's time to eat, <laughs> meaning I'm not hungry until I'm hungry. I don't think about it. But then on weekends, sometimes um, after we go to church, we come home, I might have a longer eating window. And so this is the beauty of fasting. We want our bodies to get to the point of metabolic flexibility. So it weaves in and out of the fat burning and glucose burning stage. If you follow Mindy Pell, she talks about being a sugar burner or fat burner. So the first six weeks or so, you're still a sugar burner and you do still have hunger. But once your body switches over, those glycogen stores are empty in the liver, then you are full throttle fat burning. And one of my clients even says when he gets it after 24 hour fast and he's lost a hundred pounds with me, he's a celebrated chef in the state of Arkansas, the number one chef in Arkansas. Um, and he said, I can almost feel it eating away the fat on my waist after I get about 20 hour, 24 or 25. And I don't know if it is physiological or psychological, but it, it is a motivator because you're thinking I don't have to eat, but I will. Cause we're, we're no, we're not promoting an eating disorder or disordered right. eating. We're promoting eating to when your body needs it. Like our ancestors, they ate when the fatted, whatever the animal was on the spit. And guess what? They didn't eat till they killed another one. That could have been a week. And so your body then responds. Uh, ben Azadi talks about the innate intelligence our body has. And, but big food and big pharma are like, no, 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 no. Your bodies aren't that smart. You need fourth meal. You need, you need a, a Dr. Pepper between, or what was that? 10, two and six. You need a Snickers. You don't need a Snickers. No. <laughs> Yeah, so many points. And big food do not, big food corporations do not like fasters. That is for dang sure. So no. yeah, the appetite correction does kick in eventually. Sometimes it might feel like forever, especially if you have really high insulin levels. Yeah, that's true. You know, and you're waiting for those to come down and um and self right and start to balance out and regulate. But yeah, that, that can definitely can feel like it's, it takes forever. And I'm the same way. Like I get up between five and 6am. So for me to fast until even 11 or 12 is much different than somebody who's sleeping yeah. till seven or eight. It's yeah. like, and I tell myself that I'm like, okay, well, I went to strength training at 5 30 a.m. Like that's why I'm hungrier or, you know, my menstrual cycles coming. Yes, up. for sure is. So it's important to, yeah, like you said, like pay attention to your hunger cues. You know, when it's like, I'm hungry, I need to eat versus, eh, I can wait this out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in 15 or 20 minutes that hunger passes and I go two, three hours without feeling hungry again. So, and it's like, yeah, when you, when you talk about your chef friend who is like, oh, I can feel the fat melt. <laughs> you know, you literally are. It's like, that is just in meals that have been packed there for years and years yeah. it's different than eating another it's like do you want to eat another meal and burn that or do you want to burn all of that extra garbage that you ate when you didn't know any better right I'd love for you to talk to us about your Hashimoto's and um, your thyroid function because I can't tell you it's almost daily um, I have a, a webinar that people watch about insulin resistance and how to test for it. And they can ask questions during the webinar. And it's almost daily. I get a question. My doctor told me because I have low, low thyroid function, I cannot fast. What do you think? Like there are so many people with Hashimoto's low thyroid function, even maybe even over thyroid function who are told we, you can't fast because you have thyroid disease. So what do you say to that? Well, I think that um, for one thing, if 
they had some training in endocrinology. There's always a diabetic educator and diabetic educators, as we know, are bought and paid for by big pharma, right? And so the diabetic educator wants to manage your diabetes. They don't want to reverse it. You and I know it can be reversed. And so the mantra they have is to eat five or six meals a day to protect you. Well, thyroid patients also go to that same diabetic educator and endocrinologist, and that has seeped into family practice and internal medicine. And it's a lie. The Again, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to say it this way. The, the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And in that, we are designed to go for periods without a fork to our mouths. And it's the best thing for your body to skip a a period of eating. If that may be breakfast, that may be a snack, just skipping it so your body can work on your behalf. And for thyroid patients, of course, my attorney wanted me to tell you this is not medical advice, but for thyroid patients, you can absolutely fast and fast beautifully and I'm glad no one had that um, message in my ear. I don't know if I would have taken a step back because sometimes I don't listen because I am a researcher, um, mm -hmm. but you very well can fast and you will feel your best. And again, so that's why I almost think people are coming to this podcast going, well, I want my money back. I want to hear someone who's lost, you know, 97 pounds and in two months. Well, mine was 15 pounds and, you know, a few months. But what I'm doing is healing some things in my body because fasting is so healing. Now, I, so I was diagnosed finally with um, Hashimoto's, again, very high antibody count, very, very high, 1,500, and then it got to 2,400. And isn't which, like under 15 30, or 15? 30, yeah, you, you want it really at 10. You, don't, you want them at zero because okay. anything creeping up means it's creeping up. So I had been saying for four years after my, my third child was born in 1998, which is very common to have an autoimmune attack after pregnancy and childbirth. It's just yep. what happens. And so that's when my vitiligo showed up. Uh, that's when my Hashimoto showed up. I have a rare swelling disorder. It showed up after each pregnancy. So I had her in 98, 99, I started saying something's not right. Like I, I was gaining some weight. What happened also, which is very common before. So the pendulum swings with your thyroid and because of antibodies and autoimmune conditions, sometimes you can swing both ways. You can have Graves and you can have Hashimoto's. So right before my Hashimoto's, the onset, I started saying, oh my gosh, I got real skinny, you know, again, a size a, a six for a five, eight. And I was like, well, this is fun. My pants are big. I had the little cute little red sweater and little red pants because we're at the University of Arkansas and I had my red on. And then a few months after that, nothing had changed. All of a sudden those pants couldn't zip up because what probably happened was right before my thyroid blew out, the soldiers came out and they said, let's give it one last college try. <laughs> let's do something and give her a thyroid. And it went <laughs> petered and code totally petered out took me four years to get diagnosed because no one looked at my antibodies. My TSH was creeping up. TSH is one tiny piece of the puzzle. You have to look at your T3, T4, reverse T3. Um, you have to look at antibodies. You have to look at your high sensitivity C-reactive protein to see if you have inflammation. I mean, there are just a lot of pieces to this puzzle. And I'm sorry that your doctor only tests for TSH. Go back and demand an entire panel, complete thyroid panel. And Which finally, when I got that, of TH, TSH, it's a pituitary hormone, so not even no, it's thyroid. So, but as we know, the carrot that dangles is if your TSH is out of range, here's a drug, right? Because as we know, big pharma is the one that drives your doctor to fix whatever's ailing you through a pill. And you and I are saying, no, I back up. You don't have to have a pill. You can do some things with your body. And for thyroid patients, it often is removing gluten. You're saying, but gluten doesn't bother me. My stomach doesn't hurt. Glyphosate is on the gluten and that then in turn attacks your thyroid or other conditions. So with mine, it did take four years to get the diagnosis. And I mean, they, 
uh, diagnosed me with depression. My husband said, you're not depressed, but you're the most tired adult I know. Yeah. Like I was, I was taking three naps a day. His mother had stage four breast cancer. And he has said, he said had more energy than I did. I couldn't, I, I, and I was homeschooling my kids. I was still doing some radio TV. I was barely hanging on. I was, they gave me Adderall and I am ADD. So what? But the Adderall probably got me over the hump of the energy part, but it only lasts, you know, a few hours because it's short half-life. Um, so I, I couldn't, uh, y'all, I mean, I was having a really hard time. They would ask me to fill in on morning shows. I couldn't do it. I didn't have the brain power or anything because thyroid controls brain fog can often be thyroid. So I'm so glad that I was on a thyroid journey, which gave me the love for women's health. And it gave me the love to help to empathize with women because I've been there. Um, and I did all that before I focused on fasting because the two messages could have um, exploded. And I, I, I could have then maybe been told, well, you can't do this because I may have asked a doctor. I mean, I wouldn't now and I didn't then. Um, I just ripped the Band-Aid off and started fasting and I absolutely turned my health around again. So this, I, I started going to a naturopath um, a few months ago to see if I could reverse my, my annoying thing. It's just cosmetic is the vitiligo, but I was like, can we reverse my thyroid? And because now I think in my case, Shanna, because I've had it for 20 years, the gland is so diseased. It's atrophied. I don't have goiter. If you even palpated it, which is when your provider comes in front of you and smushes around your feels like your windpipe, they're feeling the gland. Mine is atrophied. It's been diseased for so long because of the autoimmune condition. So I tried to get off my medicine. Didn't work. Lost a whole lot of hair. My TSH went up. Um, I probably put on a few pounds. Again, I don't check, but I could tell. And now I'm back full, the full throttle of, I take NP thyroid, um, 120 milligrams, uh, 60 BID, 60 milligrams twice a day. Um, and that's what I have to do to keep my thyroid functioning. And that's a very individual case, but I see it all the time. It can be done. Right. And people say, well, will your, pro will your program reverse my Hashimoto's? You know, can I take your program when, when I have thyroid disease? It's like, yeah. I can't predict that for you. Yeah. I don't know what the root cause of your thyroid disease is. If it's insulin resistance, which a lot right. of it yes. is driven by insulin resistance, or at least intensified by it. Like we can usually, you know, for the vast majority of people, we can improve thyroid function, but I'm not going to sit here and say, we're going to reverse every single case of it because it just, it, it, it is very individual, but you can definitely better manage it with reversing the, the insulin resistance and, and just reducing inflammation, like you said. And I was much like you, like you said, well, I, I lost 15 pounds. It wasn't, you know, and mm -hmm. um, that was game changing. It's not like I lost 50 or a hundred pounds. Like I lost only a couple pounds, but mentally what intermittent fasting and, and leading a low insulin lifestyle did for me is mind boggling. Like, I just don't think about eating all. I mean, I certainly do when I'm hungry. Yes. But, or, you know, when it's my meal or two, usually I eat two meals a day just cause that's the phase that yep. I, I didn't yep. always do that, but, um, yeah, I, I don't think about food in between. I am not like getting up and having to eat and feeling shaky and feeling hangry. And I go like, I, I look forward to Aaron day when I am just in my car zipping around. Um, cause I don't take snacks with me. I used to always be like, okay, how many, do, how many snacks do I have? Like, oh, I, I had a zone bar with me it back. <laughs> yes. When I first started, because I didn't think I could make it one time I had to do 19 hours. And so I had a zone bar with me in my purse. And six months later, that thing had been mangled and smushed. <laughs> there is no emergency. There's yeah. no food emergency. There's no hunger emergency. And I bet like you, when you're insulin resistant, I had to plan my day around when I was going to eat, when I was going to have breakfast. If we were traveling, where were we going to have snacks? I would bring snacks in the car, where we would eat on the road. Now, when I travel, I love traveling in the facet state. I love flying in the facet state. Mm -hmm. I love, I love getting to my destination thinking, Ooh, what am I going to have in your city? Because I can go all day 
with just bottled water or unsweetened tea or whatever the drink is, and you feel your best in the fasted state. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. I know. And, and I would, I would totally agree with that. And I do all my podcast episodes and my recordings and my interviews in a facet yeah. state as well because it just feels so much sharper. Yes. Drinking tea with, I put Redmond's real salt in. I have cinnamon yeah. tea and I put Redmond's in it and that's what I have during my fasted state. Um, and yeah, it's like, I'll, I do do use, use some stevia, but it's always after I eat. So yeah. definitely um, game changing. All right, what else here? What do you, what advice do you have? Um, so we talked about Hashimoto's and I would, I would think you would, you would, you would say the same. Cause I get the same question from women going through perimenopause and menopause. Like, can I do your program or can I reverse my insulin resistance? Or is this program for me? Cause I'm through menopause. It's like, well, if you're through menopause, that's easier. Like you're, you're yeah. kind of like a man at that point with <laughs> your hormones, mm -hmm. you know, they're fluctuating so much, but, um, what advice do you have for people just starting out or who are newer to an intermittent fasting lifestyle? Cause like you said, like appetite correction does take several weeks. And yep. I remember my first time I went 18 hours fasted. I did it on a Sunday. And I mean, I was having, I was struggling going until nine o'clock in the morning without eating. Cause I would like get up at five or six and eat something immediately. Mm -hmm. And, um, I went to church one day and it got out at 1145. I'm like, I'm not going to be getting home till noon. And I came out. I'm like, what was the big freaking deal about? You're thinking <laughs> I didn't die <laughs> fasting. I feel like it's no longer. So yes. Do you have advice for those just starting out who are thinking, you know, I, there's no way this is going to work for me. Or I have people write in to me, like I'm starting a new job and I'm like, well, great. Like it's, it makes it easier for you. Now you're at work or, you know, you, you can, it's so flexible. You can do this anytime, anywhere, any job, you just make it work for you. I would say stay busy, bring salt with you everywhere you go. My, my client said he used to dip skull and he kept it in the car. Now he dips breadman sea salt. Yes. <laughs> so he keeps that with him and stay hydrated. But I would also say I would address magnesium deficiencies and I would start the magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizer just to, because the uh, hanger you feel is um, not just your insulin resistance, but it's also electrolyte imbalances. The The headache, it's really not the headache. If it, In fact, we started curing headaches here in the Fisher household with just salt. If you had a headache during the day, we start saying, well, why don't we try salt before, because I don't, you know, Tylenol is really bad on your liver. Advil's really bad on your gut. If you have to take it, you have to take it. Um, we have, you know, allergies in the South and I mean, they're all over the world, but try salt first and see if you are dehydrated and staying hydrated, staying busy. Um, you know, we called them message boards then. Now get in social media groups where they're encouraging you about intermittent fasting. And then starting to find, you know, we learned this at IIN, love the foods that love you back. Mm -hmm. When you start loving the foods that love you back, you you don't have the hangover feeling the next day. You're not puffy the next day. You don't have GI distress. You don't have, which can be dumping syndrome, which is an immediate um, urge for, you know, you immediately have to empty your bowels or constipation, which that means something's wrong upstream, right? So start finding the foods that make you feel your best. It's typically not gluten anymore because of what they've done to the crop. Yes, your grandmother was the town's baker of yeast breads, but things have changed since grandma had that, right? Um, I would start eliminating the things that bother you. The typical ones, as you know, are soy, conventional dairy, and gluten, and then sugar and alcohol. Um, but you you find out what's the best fit, you, what the hand and glove is for you. For me, it is an animal-based diet. Um, so as Dr. Fung talks about the hormone signaling that is what pushes you to eat and to overeat, right? 
um, the hormone signaling that makes you stop eating after you reach appetite correction can only be obtained. I hope you're listening. It can only be, or attained, I guess. It can only be attained through foods that are high in fat and protein because that's the only ones that fire cholecystine kinin, which is this magical um, hormone that tells you you don't need any more food. But if you're eating low-fat foods, diet foods, vegetables all day and fish you're ne- you're always going to be hungry i'm not hungry so because today when i open my window i'll probably have a burger patty with some um i have some raw cheese here um cottage cheese doesn't bother me a lot of people have to eliminate it um i'll have a cup of bone broth 10 grams of protein i'll have an avocado i'm trying to think what else and then I'm full. Like yeah. there, there isn't any more room at the end for any of the food to, to enter because I eat food so high in satiety. Um, sometimes later, because I don't want anyone to be judged by your intermittent fasting might be that you do eat two or three meals in a five or six hour window. That's fine. It's whatever works for you. So I probably will eat something tonight. I'm taking my granddaughter someplace. Um, but I, because protein is so important, especially for a post, anyone over 40 for the uh, muscles that your muscles really need the protein. I might take my own um, protein shake with me. A lot of those are crappy. So you really have to look at the ingredients, you know, don't go to a smoothie bar because you know what the smoothie bar they're doing. I looked at one yesterday, low non-fat yogurt. I was like, you don't have high fat yogurt. They went, no. And they were real proud of it. And I went, I left. I mean, I don't want non-fat anything. So yeah. it's, it's best to eat at home. It really is. And with that, so I might, if I'm hungry, I'll probably, you know, I, I may be, may not be, I don't know. But if I am, I know I have something. It, that's why I'm saying hunger's not an emergency. I never have to pull over and get fries at Wendy's. I never have to pull into a gas station and oh, go get something. Now, if we're traveling, I will make this caveat. We're traveling, my husband and I, because we're empty nesters. That's what you do as empty nesters. You start getting in the car and going places. And it's the best times. And you listen to podcasts and stuff. Um, we've been in small towns before we got into the larger town where it was two or three in the afternoon. We hadn't eaten. And I did go into Walmart and they have boiled eggs. They had uh, sliced meat and cheeses. And I op- I had a snack then at three, and then he and I stopped. We were from Little Rock to Kansas City. Um, we got into Kansas City and then had dinner in Kansas City at a steakhouse at six o'clock, and everything was fine with my world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have these um, gas stations called Quick Trip around where I'm at. Yeah. They're floating. They're going everywhere. Yeah, I've seen them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we have, like, we won't stop unless it's at Quick Trip because they have, it's like a mini grocery store in there. They, they have- do eggs and the cheese and the vegetables yes. And yes. You just pile up on all those things and they have amazingly clean bathrooms <laughs> so yeah right. you just got to get through that first week or two and um yeah. and, you know if you can only do 14 to 16 hours the first week that's fine and so what I tell my students it's like okay first we're giving up snacking and focusing on meals yes that's so <laughs> important yeah. let's talk about that Snacking is really the bane of our existence. It is, it is, it is the biggest saboteur of what you're doing because you're telling insulin, come on, stick around. Mm -hmm. And if you could give up snacking, that's a great first tip. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that at first because I didn't know about insulin's role. I ate and then I probably had a snack because I thought my window's open. I can eat anything I want. Well, not so fast. I went through that too. And and, and and even being a nutritionist, I'm like, well, my window's yeah. open. Like I can eat this yes. whole time. And no, it's like, and then once I went to just meals and really focused on that yes. first, the first meal being high protein yes. with some natural fat and a little bit of fiber, you know, if, if that works for you, 
then I, then that was kind of the golden ticket. Like it took me a while to get there though. And I, when I first started to, I would get to where I was going to be done, you know, at six o'clock or whatever. I'm like, ah, oh, I better eat some more things because I'm not going to be eating. And I never, ever do that. Like, I don't even think about that anymore, but I know when, when you first start, you want to like pack it into the end of your eating. Um, yes. And Jen Stevens said famously, and I, I didn't hear it till the, after I'd been fasting for a year, never eat for future hunger. Right. Right. So don't think at night, I've got to go ahead and have an apple with some cheese on it or peanut butter and a smoothie and some ice cream so I can make it till the next day. Your body is looking for an excuse to burn the fat off your butt, waist and hips. And the best way to help it, it do that is by removing any insulin so it can do its job. And right. I didn't know that at first. And that was a big mistake I made. Because again, I, I was an early adopter and we didn't have this, you know, type of this much communication about the best thing to do. And you, especially walking through it and giving the advice from your point of view is so important for people. So bravo to that. Oh, thank you. And I love your quote, the love the food that loves you back because yeah. I like people who listen to my podcast know my biggest pet peeve is when, you know, people get on me about what I feed my kids or what our family's doing, or, you know, they think I'm like the crunchy mom, <laughs> like yeah. I'm, I'm going to extreme. It's like, no, I'm protecting my kids. Yeah from future metabolic disease. And when you look around and 93% of American adults uh -huh. are not metabolically healthy, yeah, you probably think I'm a little bit extreme because I'm in that actual 7% <laughs> Me too. of Minority. Met metabolic he metabolically healthy. And I want to teach my kids those fundamentals. They get to choose later when they're out of my house on their choices and what, what they're going to make. So I love that your son brought this all to you. I didn't know that. That's, that's mm -hmm. a and, and he still eats that way. In fact, one of his tricks, because he's 6'3 and about 210 pounds, he <clears throat> looked like, you know, he went to college thicker because he played high school football and people thought he was going to, he would, you know, they would look at it. He looks like a D1 athlete, but there are no D1 athletes on the, in, in the engineering school, I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, there may be, but not often. So <clears throat> he probably started college um, six, three, and probably about two thirty five because he was a wide receiver. And then he's down to about two ten, really, really fit. Um, but he does. So he has an eight hour eating window because he's not trying to lose weight. He lifts in the mornings and, you know, he has this routine. Um, he opens his window with the bulletproof coffee He has, you know, bacon and eggs. That's he, eats pretty much a keto diet, but one of his hacks I think is cute because we are creatures of habit, right? And we do have signaling, you know, you, you smell the food when you walk through the, the airport or the mall and you smell it and you think, oh, it's time to eat. It, it's part of our signaling, right? So one of his signals is um, he closes his window at eight o'clock, which is late. Like, I, would, you know, mine's never yeah. been open that late, <laughs> but I, he's not a six year old woman. Right. Um, but he eats an avocado to close it or he does have peanut butter or cheese. He does close it with fat, like at the end of his meal. And he brushes his teeth and he says out loud, we're done, you know, food, food's over for the day, or I'm finished, or I'm fasting, I'm not feasting, like he tells himself, which yeah. I think is pretty funny. The things we tell ourselves, and this is what I tell my clients all the time as a fasting coach, don't talk ugly to Lisa in the mirror. Don't, don't say, because you're never, there's no wagon here, people. You're not all... You did, you're not off a wagon or on a wagon. You just had a longer feasting window. That's called life. Live your life. And so the days you do, you know, you had ice cream at the end of your meal. Great. You could. I'm glad you didn't have it as a snack. Right. You know, while, you're, while your insulin was working on your behalf, you had it at the end of your meal. Great. That's another thing that um, has opened my eyes. Ben Bigman's book, Why We Get Sick, totally changed my life when I read it. In fact, I told Jen Stevens about it. She hadn't even heard about it yet. She was like, what? Cause it, I was early with that book, listen to it on one of our road, road trips. Um, and then the glucose goddess explaining to me that once insulin has been called, you know, once your glucose and insulin are engaged, 
to stack the meal. And Dr. Fung is now talking about meal snacking, having protein and fat, having a carb, having simple carbs. And if you want dessert, having it then. So yesterday when I opened my window at 3 p.m., um, I had a drink that had a sweet flavor to it. I didn't drink the drink first. I made sure I had the chicken and the cheese first, the fattiest part of my food, then a couple of bites of rice. I really had more of a snack at this point. And then I sipped on that drink because we don't want to keep our insulin elevated all day. And that's what I did for years thinking I was self-righteous. I drank the Diet Coke or the Tab um, and sipped on it because I knew I had to have liquids or the stevia flavored water all morning. And all I was doing was bombarding my body with all this insulin. And anytime insulin's called out, as you know, you're fat storing. So I was storing fat all day and had no idea because I thought my caloric intake was fewer than 1200 calories. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be fewer than 1200 calories, but it's insulin. Yep. You're not accessing your fat stores. Yeah. You can't get to your fat stores. That's so important understanding. So I didn't understand that whole visual that I now can see with it, but now I'm like, I got it. I, I, I want to access my fat stores as much as I can. That's what I always tell my students. Like when it clicks, it clicks and then you just get it. And yes. get it for life. And you yes. need to falter after after this because you know what you know. And yeah, Dr. Right. Bain is one of my absolute favorites. So is glucose status. I've learned so yeah. much. And we talk about meal order on this podcast all the time. And I know I tell my kids, I'm like, if you want ice cream, have it after lunch. And then right. like we're done after dinner. Then we're done, right. We're insulin sensitive at lunchtime than you are in the, you know, and yeah. you're athletic. So it's like, well, yeah. right. You're at practice until seven or eight o'clock. That's different. But for the most part, like if you want your dessert to have it at lunch, like it works a lot better, especially if you're going to be more active during the day. So, well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Where can we find more about you? If people want to follow you, I know you do some health coaching and, and intermittent fasting coaching as well. I do. So, um, when I was on the radio, people said they would do things and they'd go, why did you buy your jewelry at Cecil's? Cause Lisa Fisher said, or they <laughs> would, they would, they got a new haircut. Why did you do that? Cause Lisa Fisher said, so my website is Lisa Fisher said there's a C in Fisher. And then my Instagram handle is at Lisa Fisher said my Twitter handle is at Lisa Fisher said my podcast is Lisa Fisher said, you see, I have a marketing brain too. So my marketing brain combined it all. It is one message because you will improve your life. And I will tell you how just the same way you do. And that the things you can do starting today, you can start writing that ship today with Shanna said, or Lisa Fisher said. <laughs> love that. Well, it's been a fun hour and we've learned a lot. I love your story. I love the work that you're doing to get your Thank story you. out and to help others. Um, all we can do is hope that more and more people really start to understand metabolic health and teach others about it. And I yes. feel like even if you just, you know, hit one person in the family, look what happened with your son. It's like, it's just, yeah. phenomenal. Right. and, and then it's like, my kids are going to know about this. So their kids are going to know about it. And it's just, hopefully we turn this metabolic mess so. <laughs> sooner than later, but thanks so yeah. much for coming on today. Thanks for having me.